Okay, well, welcome everyone. Thank you uh, uh, again for the opportunity to be here in front of Science Circle and talk a little bit about anthropology, ethnography, and my research. Uh, today we're going to uh, talk about Henu Potowara, the supernatural anti-hero of the mythical past. And uh, I hope you uh, find it uh, a, a, a interesting slice of alternative culture from the Darien of Eastern Panama. So the way I have this talk organized is uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about this story of Henu Poto, and then I would like to give you some background information and some uh, show you some ethnographic slides of Embanak culture at the same time. And then I would like to tell the story of Henu Poto. So I'm going to give you some background information about the nature of the story and how I see it fitting into culture. And then I'm going to actually tell the story. So um, I'll be paying pretty much attention to my slides so I don't watch uh, nearby chat very well. So uh, if uh, someone will uh, pay attention to chat and make sure I don't miss anything important. And then we'll have some comments and questions at the, at the very end. So here we go. So first of all, thank you for coming and hanging out. Uh, and thanks to Science Circle for making an opportunity in this time of crisis and COVID where we can get together and perhaps transport ourselves to, uh, well, we've been transporting ourselves to quantum mechanics and messenger RNA and black holes and cosmology and quarks and, and uh, subatomic particles. Well, today we're going to take a journey to an indigenous culture. It's a little different than the things that we've been doing in Science Circle, but I hope you in, in enjoy the opportunity to explore a slice of this very interesting culture in uh, Eastern Panama. And preliterate cultures uh, heavily depended upon narratives, myths, and storytelling as a way of transmitting information from, from generation to generation. And of course, storytelling in almost every society is considered an art form. And uh, in our culture, it's not an exception. Although the personal telling of stories is maybe somewhat diminished in our culture, we have an incredible uh, storytelling heritage in TV and in movies. So we are uh, doing nothing more than exploring the tradition that has existed for many thousands of years and is very much alive and well in our culture, although it has been transformed in oh so many uh, interesting ways. Uh, so all the material for this talk are located at my website, trail2.com, Henu Poto. And this includes the stories themselves in English and Spanish, and in the Embana version, along with this talk and along with the uh, graphics that I'll be using in the talk. So if you do get interested in exploring this in more detail, uh, feel free to go there and uh, pick up the materials. It's also available at the um, exhibit, uh, the ethnographic exhibit of two cultures that we have hosted in the community virtual library. So this talk, comes from the indigenous group of the Embana, and they live, reside in the Pacific coastal lowlands of Colombia and Eastern Panama. And they have, of course, a long tradition of telling stories. And this is one of uh, several dozen stories that I've collected, and it, uh, and it is about um, a supernatural um, a creature, Henu Poto, and would like to uh, chronicle his story, but give you some uh, background. So Henu Poto actually means leg-born child or leg-born son. And it's one of the more famous Embana stories. And he uh, is given a number of incredible Herculean tasks that he has to execute, and it involves engaging with the supernatural ecologies and demonic densians of Embana cosmology. Yes, Ligborn, uh, 
Siz will get into that. Uh, there's actually a reason for this, and uh, we'll, we'll explore the details. <clears throat> so this paper presents uh, the story and discusses some of the uh, concepts associated with the story. But before I get into that, I'd just like to say that this paper was originally presented, and this is the only the second time that I presented this paper in, in, in public. Uh, the first time was in a double session at the Applied Anthropology meetings in memoriam of Philip Young, who was my mentor and academic advisor. And, and Philip and I were very close. He visited me in Panama regularly, and uh, all of his students got together and we held a, a special session uh, commemorating uh, his uh, mentorship of, of our anthropological work. And of course, there are many acknowledgments, and you can go to the website and read about them in detail. But I'd just like to highlight just a few of the of, of folks that I, uh, that I uh, acknowledge in my research. And the narrator is Alipio Flacco, and his family adopted me. And I spent many, many months um, with them and became integrated into their, into their family. And the translators of the Embana are Daniel and, and Nilsa Castaneda, who are brother and sister. And they happen to be the grandson and granddaughter of a very uh, powerful shaman that I had the privilege to work with. And uh, Nilsa Castaneda is very interesting. She worked as me, for, with me as an administrative assistant for a long time. And then she became a GIS technician. Uh, geospatial uh, in uh, in geospatial information system technician, and she's one of the foremost GIS technicians in the Republic of Panama. And this single mother put her uh, daughter through a med school with a little help from her friends, and her daughter became the first Embana physician ever in the history of their culture. The um, I had some help with the Spanish translations as well. Fiona and Christy Smythe, who were the uh, college-age daughters of a Smithsonian tropical research scientist. So they were very knowledgeable, not only in the nuances of, of, of English-Spanish translation, but of the ecological concepts and, and supernatural concepts. Uh, the villages of Pivasal and Manané, very, very small settlements in eastern Panama, and I'll point them out on a map in just a second. Uh, where I spent most of my time, and there were two uh, demons in uh, in those in those settlements that uh, spent uh, their uh, took me under their wing and shared with me uh, the knowledge that helped me to understand indigenous cosmology. And the visual aspect of this presentation is due to the excellent work of Shaf Shafil. Shafil is the artist of the drawings that. Uh, uh, that I use in my presentations, and he faithfully rep reproduces the ethnographic detail that we discussed before he starts the work, and he brings the concepts of the in, of the ethnographic detail to life in his in 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 his incredible in, in his incredible uh, artwork. <sighs> okay, so here's where we're going. We're going to the nexus of the Americas. This is where the continents of South America and Central America are joined. It is the uh, very uh, wild area of the Darien that is uh, on the border between Panama and Colombia. And as you can see in the red circle, the Comarcas of the uh, indigenous people, the Embana and Walnan, Walnan are very similar culture to the Embana. And also the Darien Biosphere Reserve is here. It's the largest reserve in Central America, 550,000 hectares of uh, pretty much old growth rainforest. So this is where we're headed. So if uh, God took uh, North America and South America in his hands and twisted, they would break right in this red circle. So. I would like to just give a little bit of ethnographic background about the uh, about the Embana. So the Embana traditionally live along the rivers, uh, mostly the upper rivers of the Pacific Coastal Lowlands of the Department of Chocó and Colombia, and the Darien Province in eastern Panama. 
They're subsistence horticulturalists who depend on fishing, gathering, and hunting from the tropical rainforest traditionally. Uh, socially and historically, they are egalitarian. And egalitarian means that uh, there is no uh, political hierarchy. And there was little craft specialization or political hierarchy. Uh, the craft specialization that exists were mostly shamans who became ritual specialists. And they believe in spirits who live in and co-reside with the natural world. They also have um, a belief in the mythical past that is in the early times when animals and their animal spirit masters talked and socialized with Embana. And the spirit world was considered more visible and accessible to the average person. It is in this mythical past that the story of Hanu Poto takes place. <clears throat> The Embana have a sophisticated cosmology, or if you will, religion, in which the many actors, spirits, demons, people, animals, and natural forces interact in a complex and dynamic spiritual equilibrium. It is the role of the shaman to maintain this equilibrium by creating harmony among all of these competing forces and to ensure that the spirits from time to time can be bound to human intention through carefully executed rituals that seduce the often ambivalent spirits into cooperation. And I discussed the ecological implications of this cosmological perspective in a previous paper, and perhaps sometime uh, Science Circle will permit me to, uh, to do that presentation. But I do have a, a quote from that paper. The Embana have a strong narrative tradition that communicates ecological principles. The Embana tell many stories that chronicle the acts of the Indians, animals, and spirits. The stories contain strong evocative images and symbols and form a type of encapsulated language, coding metaphorically the actions of the human and the spirit world. This language with this ecological imagery shows what happens when the cultural rules are broken and they delineate the fine line between the cultural and spiritual domain. So these are a few of the ethnographic plates that uh, show aspects of the indigenous culture and uh, this is a picture of hunting the white-lipped peccary. So the context of this story is one of the most well-known stories of the pantheon of Embana stories, myths, legends, and narratives. It is the story of a man who is born of the union between a spirit and a woman. His mother dies in childbirth, and he grows up in a troubled but powerful orphan constantly trying to locate the being that killed his mother. As part supernatural being, he executes a series of Herculean tasks that require his special skills. Like many characters and stories among the Embana, Hinu Poto is not precisely a hero, but rather a supernaturally strong anti-hero that makes embarrassing demands upon society that results in the elders always trying to figure out a way to get rid of him. However, no matter how difficult the task they assign or how unlikely he it is to succeed at his task, he comes out victorious, that is, until the dramatic end. His efforts, it can be uh, interpreted, profoundly protect society from potential ravages of the supernatural world of demons. Hinupoto is constantly upsetting and resetting uh, the balance between the human, the natural, and the supernatural worlds. Although Hinupoto is universally admired among the Embana for his strength, cunning, skill, and determination, he is also an outcast and a cosmic misfit. He also chronically naive as he attempts to track down the being 
that killed his mother when when it was he himself when he was born who caused the death of his mother in childbirth so the narrator of this story is uh, Alipio Flacco from Piwasal Darien. He is uh, currently a, uh, a forest guard in the Bio Darien Biosphere Reserve. And at the time of the, he told this narrative, Alipio was about 18 years old. He was surrounded by family, his two younger brothers, two younger sisters and mother, and a few close friends. And it is the evening after supper, which is the traditional time to tell stories like Hindu Poto. I was very pleased that Alipio told with strong oratory skill, uh, such a detailed, well-executed and comprehensive version of the story. Even so, in all of its details, it does vary from other versions of the story told in other locations by other narratives. So it is traditional among the Embana to have someone uh, offer comments and make uh, jokes and, and, and make little noises like uh, people are doing in chat right now. Uh, <laughs> as the person tells the story. And so it is his uh, sister that is operating as the, as, as the challenger to his story as he tells it. And in the text of the story, you can see her, 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 sharp, her sharp comments as, as she comments on his telling of the story. And, uh, it, and you can see the, the type of residence in, in the lower right. And here you see a couple of women doing ritual preparations. Uh, but in the lower right is the house similar to where this story was, was told. And so, um, I would like to just mention a little bit about the delicate balance in mythical time. So it, in many ways, Embana culture is about maintaining balance in order to ensure that the forces, the supernatural forces do not spiral out of control. And here you see a ritual preparation of calling the spirits in order to make a petition. This delicate balance uh, represents the forces of the natural world the world of spirits and, and the human social reality is clearly a major theme of the story of Hanupoto. He acts in so many in, inappropriate ways, yet he is clearly assisting the Ambana to defeat their traditional enemies in the mythical past and liberate the gifts jealously guarded by the spirit demons, and we'll see that in the story. The concept of mythical time is also difficult to appreciate. I had a very difficult time uh, <laughs> trying to get people to explain to me what this concept was. It is as if Hinupoto was here yesterday, but the elders say it was a time before their grandparents. On the other hand, it would not seem impossible to some Embana that Hinu Poto walked the earth in recent years in some little known river in the department of Choco, Colombia. So as I mentioned, it is up to the shaman to help maintain this balance. And I would like to just say a couple words about the value of narratives in understanding cosmology. And cosmology is a little different than we've been using it in Science Circle. Cosmology is just an anthropological fancy word for religion or religious beliefs. The value of the narrative to Western participant observers is that all of the main coding systems for cosmological knowledge uh, narratives are perhaps one of the most transparent and easy to access systems. Rituals, shamanic practices, music, even ethnobotanical procedures are so much more opaque and subject to more slippery interpretation. At least the stories can be translated into English or Spanish and their metaphors and relationships analyzed. Now, I would just like to talk a little bit about assumed knowledge. So in this story, there's all kinds of assumed knowledge. And uh, uh, I would like to make a few comments uh, uh, about this. So uh, here you can see 
the ritual chicha that is uh, prepared to seduce the spirits through its intoxicating smell. The people get to drink this at the end of the day, of course, after the ritual uh, prep, after the ritual ceremony. And this chicha is considered as a supernatural force. And this is an important concept for understanding the story about Hinu Poto. And we're going to get into that. Notwithstanding their apparent transparency, that is, of narratives, uh, narratives uh, and banal narratives are crammed full of assumed knowledge on the part of the listener. The stories articulate within a system of belief, a method of thinking about and encoding the nature of mind, spirit, your social roles, nature of culture, ecological relationships, and the cosmos. For example, when Alipio says, our father in the story, this is really Ancore, a powerful creator spirit, and is really most likely that the missionaries have insisted that Ancore be interpreted as our father. And when Alipio states that the father spirit made love to the beautiful young woman between her toes, and we'll see that in just a few moments, it is likely that many Ebena listeners are actually visualizing something like a crystalline, pale white beam of moonlight that pierces through the thatched roof and that strikes her in her toe and uh, fertilizes her with her with the spirit's cosmic sp uh, sperm so that she becomes pregnant in the calf of her leg. The Western assumption is most likely that the image of male-female physical sexual intercourse between her toes this is, of course, unsaid in this version of the story, but almost every line is full of similar, complex, assumed knowledge in order to communicate its pregnant message. And it, it took me a long time to figure this stuff out. The people can't just easily explain this to you. You have to listen to the story, translate it, ask questions, and it is a complex process of interpretation to try to figure out what's really going on. It is also interesting that the elders later on in the story tell Hanut Poto that the moon killed his mother by sending a beam that consumed her heart. And uh, the irony is that, in part, this is true if the creator spirit fertilized his mother with a moonbeam that ultimately resulted in her death when he was born. So, uh, as you can see, the people in these diagrams are painted. These are not tattoos. So, this is ethnobotanical body paint that has a two to three week duration and provides a very important uh, uh, ritual, uh, uh, a ritual uh, 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 process. And <clears throat> so, it, in back to the yeah sumo i don't know the corn beer i hated to drink it because it ran through my system like water and it was actually quite painful and it's very low in alcohol so you have to drink a lot of it to to get a buzz <clears throat> so we mentioned about the uh, pregnancy and the calf of the leg and let me talk about the assumed knowledge there the woman becomes pregnant in the calf of her leg is symbolic the calf of the leg is thought to be an indicator of strength. Traditional Embana life requires great strength and endurance. Work in the fields, uh, trips to the forest, carrying burden baskets of crops. I asked a middle-aged man what makes a good wife once upon a time. He told me, look at the calf. If it is strong and powerful, that is a good wife. If it is skinny and not muscular, not a good wife. So the woman becomes pregnant in her calf, uh, the symbolic source of her strength and a measure of her power and prowess. Therefore, Western listeners can only approximate the true semantic and symbolic significance of the narrative's dramatic scenes because of the nature of all this collective assumed knowledge. It is similar in concept to the image of a Western visitor on an Embana hunting trip. 
the visitor sees a rainforest within a geographic and ecological context. The Embana hunter sees oh so much more, a complex interaction of natural, supernatural, and animal spirit actors all conspiring to ensure or negate the opportunity for a successful hunt. The weather alone provides the Embana hunter with a host of knowledge through which the hunter engages a complex playbook of where to go, what to hunt, how long to travel, and how many other relevant variables, such as the likelihood for an encounter with a poisonous snake. Clearly, the spirits will let us know if we only listen to them correctly. A small, significantly uh, insignificant bird call may have dramatic effect on the hunter, uh, even to the point of causing him to abandon the hunt and return home without delay and to hunt on another more propitious day. Of course, in our society, specialized knowledge is highly heterogeneously distributed too. The professional farmer sees far more detail in a country landscape than a city visitor because his vision is so tightly woven into the specialized knowledge of crops, weather, ecology, soil, microgeographic conditions, and the site and crop suitability. Any farmer worth his salt could discuss for hours the implications of a single pastoral view. And of course, it is the shaman that is helping uh, maintain the equilibrium with, uh, uh, with these supernatural forces. So I would like to say in conclusion to the uh, discussion about the uh, 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 about the uh, uh, the meaning and some of the ideas behind the story, and so it is with Hinupoto that there are many layers of meaning. Quite frankly, I don't know what it all means. I just have some insights after mi spending many years with the Imbana of attempting to understand the cultural details associated with the the narratives and some of the cosmological concepts that keep appearing over and over uh, in their stories. And I also have some Embana language skills, and, um, and I've had many years to think about what this story and others like it mean. I do feel that the story transports the observer, both Western and non-Western, into another world deceptively hidden behind everyday life. We can peek behind the curtain of Western physical reality into the indigenous view of the universe. Certainly, there is not one or even a correct meaning to the story. I, uh, I suggest it is more like a code that provides a vehicle for delivering Embanach cosmology and its attendant lessons in an easy to consume and reproducible package with potentially many layers of meaning and interpretation. The element of the code resonates with the consonant level of knowledge of the listener. Each listener, of course, with its own ability to understand uh, the details. And this was especially true for me. In my first year, I understood certain stuff. And then in the second year, oh, I threw out a lot of the things I believed and replaced it with new beliefs. And the third year and fourth year and fifth year, there were massive transformations for my understanding of Embana culture and appreciation for the detail and profound nature of their cosmological beliefs and their subsistence technologies. Uh, so it is more like a code then that provides a vehicle for delivering Embana cosmology and its attendant lessons in an easy to consume and reproducible package with the potentially many layers of meaning interpretation. The elements of the code resonate then with the co uh, consonant no level of knowledge of its listeners. Like all good stories, each layer of meaning envelops and articulates with the personal experience, social and cultural matrix of the listener. Certainly, the story is entertaining 
and to the assembled listeners that is the family that are listening. The importance of telling it well is evident as the comments of the audience indicate. There are also those elements that are difficult to capture in text. That is, the nature of the delivery, the onomatopoeia that they continuously use, the nocturnal context in which the night sounds of the old that are so close on that rainy evening in the Darien when Alipio told the story, all do not translate well into the written word. The story contains all of the introductory conversations from the listeners and the narrator that was on the tape to give a sense of how the listeners themselves approach the telling of the story, notwithstanding that some of, of the comments are quite embarrassing to the uh, ethnographer. It is interesting that throughout the entire story, the Embanar are trying to get rid of Hinupoto by providing him with impossible supernatural tasks that should have resulted in his death. But unlike many Western stories where there is generally a resolution or positive resolution in the end, there lies a great ambivalence in Hinupoto's ironic role as he consistently executes the impossible task to avenge his mother and never seems to tire as the elders redirect him to his next mission, even though he realized that they have previously tricked him. All the while, as he rids the world of the most dangerous demons, he himself is treated as a nuisance by the Embanad. So, there we go. Those are my words about the nature of the story. Are you ready for me to tell the story now? Let's see. A nuisance hero, yes. Okay. So now you know a little bit about the story, the nature of assumed knowledge, the mythical past, the uh, some uh, images of Embanar culture, the ritual, supernatural pro uh, processes, and uh, and so forth. Correct. So the subsistence technologies are uh, hunting, which of course uh, it is said that. Uh, uh, a good indigenous hunter spends more time training to be a good hunter than any engineer in our society. It takes that long to learn to be a good hunter. And then the fishing technologies, uh, they have many, many ways of harvesting riverine resources, which are numerous in the Darien. Uh, the tropical rainforest rivers have a great diversity of fish species. And it might be worth mentioning that the Darien is, and the Choco of the, uh, of the Department of Choco is the most biological diverse terrestrial systems on the earth. And they have the highest rainfall differential uh, of any place on earth as well. And uh, you can find things on Google that refute that, but if you really do a close investigation, uh, I think that you will come to this conclusion. So this is a very, very uh, complex ecosystem. And uh, so gathering plants from the forest, from this very diverse ecosystem, you can imagine the ethnobotanical uh, and medicinal um, knowledge of the Embana is huge. And it includes the use of uh, theogenic plants like uh, ayahuasca. Uh, that is used in their in, in their shamanic rituals. Let's see now if I have my up to date here. Okay, so let's tell the story. So I'm going to try and tell the story, <coughs> um, in in a way that an Embana person might tell it. But if you uh, want to see what their language looks like, uh, uh, this is what uh, the alphabet that we use. Uh, and uh, let me just say a few words. Ama aruda damara be quasida damara kina beasida chaba. Through beadeba mi manada chaba. So the language, of course, has nothing to do with Romance languages. It is uh, related to a, a, an isolated tree of Native American languages 
and it's uh, not going to be in, in Google Translate, that is for sure. This is an unwritten language when I first started doing my research, and I was involved in helping design the alphabet that is used now to by some folks to, um, to record the Embana language. And of course, this is what they're saying. The very next day, very early in the morning, he sit out with all of his lunch. At once, he began to kill the snakes with his arrow, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so the stories themselves are numbered. So there's sections and lines. So you can compare each line of the English version, of the Embana version, and of the Spanish version for those people who are interested in the original. Okay, here we go. Did I, am I up to date with chat? Anything? Um, I'm glancing at chat, glancing. I guess I'm okay. No one's pinging me and saying that I'm crazy. Where did this stuff come from? Okay. So an, a beautiful Embana woman becomes pregnant as a result of a union with a creator spirit. And it is conceived that her uh, uh, calf, actually she was fertilized between her toes by a beam of moonlight that came through the thatched roof and caused her to become pregnant as a result of the cosmic sperm from the supernatural being. And as the child grows in her leg, her friends and family become very concerned because they feel that her welfare is in jeopardy. And, of course, they're right. She gives birth to a part human and part supernatural creature, Henu Poto, and <clears throat> Henu Poto causes the death of his mother. And because Henu Poto is part spirit, uh, he has some strange habits. And one of the things that he needs in order to thrive is chicha, but not the corn chicha that is used in the ritual context that we discussed previously, but he requires blood chicha. And he needs the menstrual blood and the afterbirth of women in order to thrive. It is his supernatural sustenance. And when he can't get it, he goes out and kills snakes. And snakes are large snakes are thought to have a lot of blood. And he drinks that blood as a secondhand replacement uh, for his blood chicha. And um, of course, the women all consider him a nuisance. And they're always trying to figure out ways to get rid of him. And of course, the elders are, <clears throat> you can imagine the women lobby with the elders to get rid of this, uh, of this creature who is continuously demanding blood. And of course, blood is such an incredibly powerful metaphor in every society. And this is certainly true in uh, indigenous society. So Henu Poto is always asking uh, who killed his mother. <clears throat> and so the elders said, the moon killed your mother. And as we've already commented, the moon is a powerful um, ecological metaphor associated with femininity, waters, rain, menstruation, and pregnancy. And, and of course, it is the moon being that fertilized his mother in the calf that ultimately resulted in his death. So the elder said, it was the moon that killed your mother. And so he builds a bamboo ladder and he goes up to grab off the face of the moon and to pull off the face of the moon because he wants revenge for the person that killed his mother. And of course, the elders get all excited and upset by this and they send the, the squirrel to, to gnaw on the ladder so that it will tumble to the ground. But the squirrel doesn't do a very good job. So they send the woodpecker, Zore, to uh, peck the bamboo ladder. And the woodpecker is able to pick through the bamboo ladder right before Henu Poto uh, is reaching the face of the moon. Of course, this is going to cause a huge upset to the natural order of things 
but the woodpecker saves the day and Hinupoto falls from the sky. <clears throat> and as he's falling, he he calls out Mohopono, 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 which is the flower of the balsa tree. And, and this converts him into a flower. So he's able to float around on the air currents. But eventually he tires of, of, of floating around and then he cries out again, Mongara, 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 which means rock. And he converts to stone and he falls back to the earth. In fact, he falls with such force and with such uh, gravity <laughs> that he, uh, he falls into the underworld uh, beneath the earth. And so uh, Henu Poto discovers in the uh, underworld the Amurukos. And the Amurukos are spirit beings that kind of look like people, but they are truly spirits because they can't eat food. They derive their sustenance from the smell of food, just as the way the spirits derive uh, intoxication from the smell of ritual chicha. And they defecate out their ear. And so they're watching Hinu Poto, and they see him eating food. And they're amazed that he can eat. And they realize that Hinupoto eats and he's able to defecate through his anus. And they tell Hinupoto, we want to eat like you. We want to eat like you. So can you help us? And so Hinupoto reluctantly grabs a sharp stick and he pokes a few amurukos with the stick. And pure sand comes out and they die. But eventually he figures out how to do it correctly and he's able to poke them with a stick so that they can eat uh, food and defecate. So uh, the, the uh, Amurukos, uh, these supernatural beings are, are indebted to uh, Hinupoto, but the Amurukos are attacked by a, a variety of different animals and they kill the Amurukos. And Hinupoto says, don't, don't let these animals kill you. These are not these are not killer animals. These are game animals. We are going to capture them and I'm going to show you how to cook them and eat them. So Hinupoto goes out and he starts to kill these attacking animals and he teaches the Amurukos how to eat them. And they're so grateful because their population was being decimated by these game animals. So he taught the Amarukos to hunt and he taught them how to cook a game. And so eventually a uh, Hinupoto he he is he gets he gets bored with the world of the Amarukos and he returns to his uh, he returns to his regular world. And then he goes to the elders. He had many adventures and this story is long but I'm only just going to tell you the highlights. And one of the adventures is that the Embana tell him that the hay killed his mother. And the hay is this giant aquatic snake-like creature. It looks like an anaconda or a boa constrictor, but it has antlers like a deer. So it has a terrestrial component. It has an aquatic component. And so he goes and he builds a balsa raft and he says, I will go and I will kill the hay. And um, he gets swallowed up by the hay, who is this huge monster. And he is in the belly of the hay and he sees all kinds of, of embana and they're dying of hunger. But there's all of these food plants as well. There's all of the seed in these food plants, like the plantain and the banana and the sweet potato, and squash, and yams, and beans. So he sees all of this inside the hay, and he says to the people that are dying of hunger, don't worry, I'm going to help you. I will feed you. And so he goes and takes out his knife, cuts out the monster heart of the hay, and he drinks the blood. Of course, remember that the blood is his special supernatural chicha. And he builds a fire and roasts the heart and feeds the people. And he says, I will get you out of here. So once he builds the fire, he propped open the hay's anus with logs. It's so big. 
And then the hay expels all of the contents of his stomach. And the people that were dying of hunger are freed, along with all the many different food plants and other animal creatures that form the, the bulk of the subsistence uh, technology, agricultural, horticultural technology of the Ambana. So he's freed up all of these very important plants that form the basis of Ambana subsistence to this very day. And of course, he has many adventures with many different creatures. And, uh, but in the end, it, the elders say to him, the Hambwima killed his mother. And the Hambwima is this rather vampire-like, terrible demon that is extremely powerful. And he says, I will go and I will kill the Hambwima because it is the Hambwima that killed my mother. And he goes and he raises, raises his spear. And in some stories, it is a bow and arrow to kill the Hambwima. And as he holds his spear ready to strike the Hambwima dead, he says, well, even if I die, tell everyone that I'm going to die, but I'm not going to die. And he drops his spear instead of throwing it and killing the Hambwima, as he's done with a, with a pantheon of demons previously, he just drops his spear and he permits himself to be attacked by the Hambwima. And the Hambwima attacks fiercely and rips his throat out and tears his body into parts because it is a vicious and terrible demon. And so Hinupoto meets his ultimate fate. And he says in the story, according to Alipio, I will turn into different types. In an instant, I will turn into blood suckers. So Hinupoto lies dying, bleeding on the ground. And his blood, as it comes out of his body, it transforms into all of the different creatures that suck blood. And in the rainforest, there's actually quite a few of these things. Uh, the many species of ticks, uh, vampire bats, uh, the different leeches, they're biting flies. There are chiggers, which are arachnids, mosquitoes, uh, sand fleas, assassin bugs. And so all of the different creatures that suck blood come from the from the blood from the transformed blood of Hinupoto. So every time you're in the forest and a little creature bites you, it is a remnant of Hinupoto uh, that uh, that is affecting you. And this has a very interesting epidemiological concept, of course, from uh, from our point of view uh, in 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 the scientific world because it is, of course, the blood that is, carries disease, and it is the mosquitoes and uh, other blood-sucking creatures that carry, uh, uh, that, that carry viruses, uh, like vampire bats, rabies, and, uh, of course, yellow fever and malaria and so forth from mosquitoes. So there we go. That's the story. Of Hinupoto. So, uh, if you go, if you want to see more details about this, you can actually go to the website. And uh, it is worth mentioning again that Shafil uh, has done an excellent job of reading the stories, and we had long discussions about what details should be in the diagrams, and he faithfully represented in acute ethnographic detail, uh, the uh, information that, uh, that we both thought was appropriate to include in the different plates. So there is the story of Hinupoto. Questions? Questions in chat?
Uh, I wasn't watching chat very well, so if anyone had a question uh, uh, previously that I didn't get to take a look at, uh, uh, Umuntu says, Nexus, the notion of mythical time for the Embana, I wonder if that is a relation to the past, or does it also resonate with notions of an imagined future? For instance, in Swahili, time is measured by seasons, but backwards numerically. And in many Bantu languages, there are very little notions of the future, no future tense linguistically. I wonder if it's similar or could be completely different, not sure. Well, this is an excellent comment and an excellent question. It, it, it was really difficult for me to kind of get a handle on this mythical time. As I mentioned, it is considered something in the past, but there are some uh, there are some folks that I talked to. I said, "Could Hinu Poto be in Colombia right now in some river?" And they said, "Yes, it's possible." And so these supernatural creatures are not just relegated to the past; they are enduring uh, principles that get renovated throughout time. And Hinu Poto is not a very good example of this, but there is a, another concept. Behind every major animal is a spirit master. And this spirit master represents the sum total of awareness and capability and spirit uh, nature of the animal. So the deer has a spirit master and the jaguar has a spirit master. And this spirit master endures forever. No matter how many jaguars are killed or how many jaguars are born, into each jaguar is born and imbued uh, content from this spirit master. So this is an enduring uh, relationship from mythical time when jaguars could actually talk to people, but it, it exists in the current day and in the future as well. So uh, the concept of past, now, and future is, uh, is not so precisely identified at Imuntu as you uh, wisely uh, recommended in, in, in certain traditional cultures. Uh, there is a, a more cyclical concept of time where the renewal of natural resources takes place on different cycles. And the lunar cycle is one of the most important cycles uh, of, of, of that particular process. Uh, so I think that, uh, I, I think that, you know, traditional societies throughout the world have very different uh, uh, concepts of the nature of temporal, uh, 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 of time passing and, and temporal stuff. So it's a great comment. Okay, any, anything else? Let's see here. Okay. Uh, goodness. Life never, un yeah, but only transforming. Yes, tagline. Uh, from one form comes others, yes. Yes, and that's certainly uh, the, the transformation that occurs uh, from uh, Henupoto. He built all of this cosmological energy from all of the blood chicha that he drank from all of the different creatures. And then he serves as the transformative uh, being that is able to convert that blood energy into the blood-sucking animals of the world. Very weird concept. Something else on your mind? In Norse mythology, the story of the end of the gods was told in detail at the same time as they were worshipped as living beings. What does the story of Hinu Poto tell us about the Embana culture, and does it tell something about us? Well, I... I I, I don't I don't know, Sis. I think that uh, storytelling is a way of encapsulating a, such a broad range of knowledge, and and our stories do the same. If you go to any movie, you can write a dissertation on almost any movie, even a bad movie, about the complex 
you know, uh, communications that occur, the nature of assumed knowledge, the glances, the difference between the wink and the blink, so to speak. So in our society, if you wink at someone, uh, that is imbued with all kinds of cultural meaning, and it depends upon the context in which it occurs. But if you just happen to blink, which is nothing more than a physiological reaction, you don't want to confuse the two. So the context of how things occur is so important. And one of the problems about appreciating traditional cultures is it just takes so much work to be able to understand and appreciate the complexity of 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 what the of of what the of what the traditional people are trying to say. Okay. What is this? now? I'm curious what the Embara make of Western science fiction and what they think of Western obsession with the future. Well, there are now Embara that have gone to college and have studied to be. Uh, hydrologic technicians and forestry technicians. As I mentioned, Nilsa's daughter is now a, a medical doctor. And so um, um, I think that the conversations that I've had with educated and Bana, uh, <clears throat> there's actually two kinds of, of branches of thinking. A uh, one branch converts to Christianity <clears throat> and accepts some of the religious concepts of some of the more organized religions and others embrace the nature of the traditional beliefs. And it's not incompatible with Embana thinking to be able to embrace aspects of Christianity while at the same time maintaining uh, traditional uh, cosmology and traditional beliefs. So that's a, a very complex issue and uh, it would be something that would be interesting as Embana become more acculturated. Of course, they have cell phones today. They now have political structure. They are now integrated into aspects of the Panamanian technology, uh, uh, economics, and they have suffered severely under the crisis of COVID because of their, uh, uh, because of the nature of their isolation. So there's a lot of things going on in the modern uh, uh, aspects of, of Embana uh, life that we don't get into, of course, in this talk, but it is certainly something that uh, uh, we could talk about at some future. Okay. No more questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming and thank you for your great uh comments and of, of course uh thank you for taking time out of your lives in this terrible crisis to come escape into the rainforest of eastern panama Okay, here we go. Here's the here's the uh, exhibit of two cultures, ethnographic cultures, and and the Hin story of Hindu Plateau is in there. But there's a whole bunch of other stuff, including the information about uh, the Mola technology, which we discussed at a previous science circle uh, presentation. Okay. Oh yes, thank you, Chantel. That that's uh, uh, the the uh, all of the documents associated with the new plateau, including all the graphics in this presentation. <laughs> Does he wink or blink? <laughs> yes, Shafil is a great artist. Okay.